welcome to today's Dairy XNet webinar. Dairy XNet is a national extension driven web resource designed to meet the educational and decision making needs of dairy producers, allied industry partners, extension educators, and consumers. I'm Kathy Lee, an extension dairy educator with Michigan State University Extension, and I will be the moderator for this program. This webinar is the first of three webinars dealing with environmental issues on dairy farms. Today's topic is precision phosphorus feeding to reduce environmental impacts of dairies. Speakers are Dr. Katherine Knowlton of Virginia Tech and Jimmy Hufford, a dairy producer in Virginia. Dr. Katherine Knowlton is a professor in the Department of Dairy Science at Virginia Tech with a research and teaching program focused on environmental issues affecting the dairy industry. She is also a dairy club advisor and is assistant coach of the Virginia Tech dairy judging team. Dr. Knowlton has authored 47 peer-reviewed articles in two book chapters. We pre appreciate Dr. Knowlton's participation in today's webinar. Catherine, I'll let you continue. Thank you, Kathy. I've been very much looking forward to this and I appreciate the interest in phosphorus, in the digestion of phosphorus, in the management of phosphorus on farms. My students will tell you that when I get talking about phosphorus, it's hard to get me to shut up. So Jimmy, when I hit about 25 minutes, you can just you know, call me on my cell phone and tell me enough's enough. The focus of today's presentation is, is dietary nutrient management. And, and literally, what goes in the front end of the animal must come out the back end of the animal. So let's talk through um, how that digestion works, and then what are the implications on farms. With, when I'm speaking to non-agricultural audiences, I point out what you all know inherently, and that is that if our agricultural practices today had remained the same as they were 30 and 40 and 50 years ago, we in the United States would, would not enjoy our current standard of living. We spend a very low portion, maybe 10% of our income on food, and that is directly because of the tremendous efficiency and productivity of farms in this country, especially livestock farms. And yet, within the livestock industry, within the agriculture industry, there is a great awareness that this improvement in productivity has not come without cost. When we, uh, over the past 30 or 40 years, one of the greatest changes in our industry has been increasing specialization of our farms. Essentially, and I've highlighted Virginia here as an example area of intensive animal agriculture, but as we have specialized, we are importing nutrients from areas of primarily crop production, the uh, corn belt, the wheat belt, the phosphorus mines of South Florida, we are bringing those nutrients in to areas of intensive animal agriculture. And our livestock are not tremendously efficient in converting those nutrients. Perhaps 30 or maybe 40 percent of the consumed nitrogen and phosphorus is converted into product. Obviously, the rest of it comes right out the other end in manure. And because of expense and the bulkiness of manure, we don't turn around and ship those nutrients back where they came from. So essentially, we are concentrating nutrients in areas of intensive animal agriculture. And that has led to challenges with ground and surface water. I see our challenge uh, as being finding ways to continue the tremendous efficiency and productivity of the US agriculture industry. We have no choice on that. We have uh, people to feed, food to produce. But we do need to find ways of reducing our environmental impact. Let me show you just a couple of, of maps or, or pieces of data talking about the challenge, especially with phosphorus. This is one of a series of maps put together by the US Geological Survey. They went watershed by watershed, county by county across the US, and calculated sources of nutrients to water resources. And there's a whole series of these maps, uh, fertilizer contributions, uh, point source contributions, uh, just a whole series of maps for nitrogen and for phosphorus. And this map for phosphorus is related to animal agriculture. And I think it's telling. The areas of blue are where animal agriculture is not a significant contributor to ph phosphorus losses. But as you move up, those, the green, the olive, and the red especially, in many parts of the US, and I think those areas are, are self-evident. Uh, animal agriculture is a significant contributor to phosphorus export from the farm uh, into watershed, into, into the wa surface waters. Um, and in those areas, and uh, again, some of the places are self-evident. Obviously, the Midwest, uh, let me just show you right here uh, where I am. 
the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia is, is our breadbasket. Um, that's where our dairy industry is concentrated. That's where our poultry industry is concentrated. And you'll see that animal agriculture there is indeed more than 50% the source of, of uh, phosphorus losses. In fact, in this county-by-county county survey, every year uh, the U.S. Geological Survey conducts a county-by-county county nutrient balance. The manure nutrients produced in each county compared to the nutrients needed by crops grown in that county. And so they're calculating the nutrient balance county by county. And we in Virginia are very proud that Rockingham County, Virginia, is the number one county in the country in terms of nutrient imbalance. A little being a bit sarcastic there, but certainly it is a, these are our bread baskets, but we do need to find ways of minimizing the environmental impact of, of livestock. Let's talk about why livestock manure particularly is a source of phosphorus pollution. And that is that manure nitrogen and phosphorus are in imbalance relative to crop needs. When we apply manure to meet the nitrogen needs of crops, we are over-applying phosphorus. That phosphorus accumulates and can run off. This is data from Rockingham County, Virginia. These are the uh, summary of all of the soil tests submitted from Rockingham County, Virginia across a three-year period of time to the state lab. And the bottom line is that 90% of these phosphorus, of these samples are either high or very high in phosphorus. That is, those soils certainly need no more manure phosphorus. And this soil phosphorus accumulation is typical, really, of, of any area of intensive animal agriculture. Relevant question for today is, does diet matter? Does what we feed our cows influence what comes out the other end? And the answer, obviously, is yes. There are many researchers who have shown this sort of relationship. Uh, Larry Satter and his group in Wisconsin, uh, Deanne Morse in California, in California now when she was in Florida was one of the early ones to show this relationship. But there is a direct and linear relationship between dietary phosphorus content and phosphorus excretion in lactating cows as in so many other species. This particular data set is the first uh, experiment I did when I came to Virginia Tech, uh, oh gosh, 13 years ago. I think it took a little while for me to get it published. I, I've learned since then. But we took 13 lactating cows, and from the time they calved, fed them one of three levels of dietary phosphorus. And our intent was to be below, then at, and above their dietary phosphorus requirement. The uh, dietary phosphorus contents aren't displayed in this graph. This was 0.34% phosphorus. 0 0.52, 0 0.67. At the time, I thought this was at or perhaps just above the dietary requirement of these cows. But in fact, this 0.34% phosphorus is, as we now know, what those cows required. And what we saw is what so many others have seen, a direct linear relationship between dietary phosphorus content and phosphorus excretion. What goes in influences what comes out. And yet overfeeding was, and to some extent still is, common in the field. Extra phosphorus, our data and everyone else's data shows, does the cow no benefit? And, and yet, so why, are, why does this overfeeding occur? There are several reasons, um, and I think many of these are still, still part of the issue. Uncertainty about requirements. What's the bare minimum? Phosphorus research is expensive to do. Marketing. Uh, in terms of competition between uh, feed companies or concern about losing market share if something were to go wrong is a bit of an issue, but as, as my friends in the feed industry have told me, phosphorus is an expensive mineral, but it's not a high profit mineral. And so 10 years ago they said, hey, educate the producers that they don't need this extra phosphorus and we'll be glad to pull it out of our stock mineral mixes. And that feed industry has made just huge strides in that direction. There was, and in some corners, uh, still lingers a concern about a link between dietary phosphorus and reproduction, and we'll come back to that. Bad habits, sometimes we get into habits as far as our, our nutrient formulation. Um, we know that in dairy cows we don't have to worry about the calcium to phosphorus ratio, for instance. There's a body of research that says in ruminants calcium phosphorus ratio is meaningless, and yet there are some that still worry about that. I think a big part of the problem now is undetected variation in feed phosphorus or problem feeds, feeds that are useful feeds and contain a lot of phosphorus. Again, we'll come back to that issue. I want to back up for a minute. I'll kind of go back and forth in this presentation talking about the science and talking about some of what's going on in the field. And this is some new data that a collab good collaborator of mine, Joe Harrison, out at Washington State, has compiled. Through ARPAS, 
we surveyed dairy nutritionists across the United States, both independent nutritionists and company-affiliated nutritionists. And there were 131 respondents that had great response to this survey just done over the winter. These respondents ranged from to 150 clients, and each nutritionist anywhere from was responsible for feeding anywhere from 200 cows up to 95,000 cows. So certainly a really good cross section. And it's very interesting to see what this survey says about phosphorus feeding practices. Ah, some of these figures have been a little messed up, but I'll talk you through it. This figure is, uh, we asked the question on a scale of 1 to 10, is balancing for ration phosphorus a priority? About half said yes, it's a priority. Most common answers were either 8, very definitely a priority, or 5, yeah, a priority, but not uh, exclusively. Each of the, most of the respondents also gave us some comments, and I've just highlighted a few, and I'll let you, you can certainly read them quick, more quickly than I can read them. But uh, I've just highlighted a few here. The general message is that uh, most nutritionists, especially if they are in environmentally sensitive areas, are paying attention to dietary phosphorus. And I think this one in the lower left is, is fairly typical. Um, this nutritionist said that phosphorus requirements met or exceeded by natural sources in almost all cases. We don't ex address excesses, but sometimes nutrient management plans, therefore our clients, are asking us to pay attention to it. Here, I work close to the bay, so I constantly monitor dietary phosphorus. Um, and so it's, it's more of a priority probably than if we'd asked that question 10 years ago. Some of the other questions I think are really interesting. Oh, dear, formatting issues. This one's, uh, do you feel the current recommendation of phosphorus for lactating cows is adequate is the blue, slightly high, slightly low? The vast majority of the uh, respondents said that the uh, recommendations are adequate. Uh, again, comments slightly high, only a tad low. This is, I think, the most consistent and, and telling re reaction. And this was the most consistent reaction from the nutritionists. They are seeing consistently. They feed at NRC recommendations, and production health and reproduction is excellent. Another very confident in the, in the requirements. Obviously, uh, what I've, I've, I've chosen these comments, but they do reflect the vast majority of the comments that we received. Starting to see, and we'll come back to this later, a little bit of concern about bioavailability. And, and some nutritionists are concerned about bioavailability of phosphorus. And, and again, I, that's going to be a recurring theme. This slide I like. We asked, have you changed your recommendations for dietary phosphorus over the last three to five years? 99% say, yes, I'm recommending less phosphorus. 1% say, I'm recommending more. Uh, one nutritionist with one of the larger feed companies says, our company has recommended lower pea levels for years. I try to keep it the low end. And this one is, I think, uh, very telling. The mindset of vets and educators has changed. And, and now we know we can run lower dietary phosphorus. Their research shows us we can do that. So that's good. That's some survey data, and I'll show you a little bit more from that survey in just a couple of minutes. How can we increase adoption of reduced overfeeding of phosphorus in the field? We know the data show us that there is no benefit to overfeeding phosphorus. Many nutritionists, most of them, are moving in that direction. In Virginia, we asked the question, many environmental best management practices are cost shared to encourage adoption. Is there a way we can cost share this practice as a way simply to encourage adoption, encourage producers who are not now paying attention to their dietary phosphorus? How can we do this? And so uh, three, four years ago, we, we started this precision phosphorus feeding for Virginia dairy farms with support from Natural Resources Conservation Service, Virginia's uh, Department of Conservation and Recreation. The gist of this program uh, through the project, we subsidized bi-monthly feed sampling and analysis, what, including what chemistry for all of the major nutrients, including phosphorus. We collected data from each farm, allowing us to calculate phosphorus requirements specific for that farm and their phosphorus intake. We calculated to the extent to which that each farm was overfeeding or, or where they were feeding relative to the requirements. 
and we offered incentive payments each year. Farmers that were paying within 5% of the requirement received an incentive payment of $12 per cow per year. If they were not quite so close, within 15% of the requirement, $6 per cow per year. And if they were overfeeding, uh, but still within 25%, so 125% of the requirement, those farms received a smaller incentive payment. And there was no penalty for overfeeding, obviously. Uh, we had 215 herds sign up. And each year, more farms succeeded in receiving the incentive payment. Uh, we are seeing that phosphorus feeding in these herds is down by 5 to 15 percent. The axes didn't come through, but by the third year, 75 percent of our farmers were at least within that 25 percent. Most of them were within 50 percent. So we saw reduced overfeeding of phosphorus. And in, this is interesting. Our feed industry said to us they were glad we were doing this project. As soon as we started and started reporting back to the farmers the, the extent to which they were overfeeding, uh, the feed industry told us that their phones began ringing and farmers began saying, why? Why am I overfeeding phosphorus? I don't want to be overfeeding phosphorus. I'm not going to get this incentive payment. I need you to adjust my diet. And again, the feed industry was glad to get that feedback in, in all of my experience um, because they certainly have no interest in doing anything that's going to endanger the, the future livelihood of their, of their customers. But they needed it to be a customer-driven it needs, the information needs to come from both sides. And so for it to be a customer-driven request was, was very useful. Next steps on this, there is a great deal of interest nationally in converting this to a national cost share standard. And whether that cost share program will um, subsidize the feed analysis, incentivize the level of, 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 of phosphorus feeding, some of those details still need to be worked out. Let's go back to that survey. We, we, this survey gave us the opportunity to talk to people who are feeding an awful lot of the U.S. dairy cows and, and ask them, what's the most challenging aspect of reducing dietary phosphorus? Well, this, this lack of captions is, is frustrating. The top bar, uh, the most challenging aspect by far, 60% uh, of the nutritionists indicated that uncertainty of the phosphorus content of feedstuffs was their most challenging problem. They simply, especially feeding large quantities of byproduct feeds to get that good data on every load, that's a challenging aspect. It, the more unknown the nutrient composition of those feeds, the more of a safety margin they felt they had to bring in. The second most common answer, nearly 40% of nutritionists said cost. That is, and here's a comment down here, Sometimes higher phosphorus feeds, like distillers dried grains, and there's mention here of a soy and wheat and brewer's grains, are in fact high, very high in phosphorus. And those are good feeds, and often they are cost-effective feeds. Therefore, we're finding that overfeeding phosphorus may be more economical in some cases. And that's a real issue. Ten years ago, overfeeding was usually associated with having inorganic mineral phosphorus in the diet. Now, increasingly, it's because of high phosphorus byproduct feeds. Uh, this answer, the third most common, but also part of this answer, several nutritionists brought up this issue of phosphorus availability. They're concerned that, especially these byproduct feeds, uh, that the organic phosphorus may not be fully available. Let's, let's dig into that a little bit. Uh, one more slide, and, and basically saying the same thing. What new information do you need? And number one answer, survey says, information on availability of phosphorus from different sources. Number two answer, updated requirements for maintenance, production, and reproduction. And number three answer is essentially the same. More documentation that NRC recommendations are adequate. But this concern is about feedstuff variability and bioavailability of phosphorus in feedstuffs comes up frequently. And of course, the distiller, distiller's grains is the first one we think of as ethanol production has, has escalated. The availability of distiller's grains and other byproduct feeds has, has escalated too. And again, these are good feeds. Um, incorporated in durations at reasonable levels, they're good feeds. And I'd a lot rather they be fed to dairy cows than landfill. 
and they bring with it a challenge of, of high phosphorus content. And sometimes this question of availability. So let's talk about that. Conventional wisdom in most of the published research that you will see will tell you that organic phosphorus in feedstuffs is as available, is fully available to the cow. And that's different than in pigs and chickens. And you know that's because of the ruminal microorganisms. They contain the enzymes to degrade this organic phosphorus. And I'll choose phytic acid as in the, a, a, the classic source of organic phosphorus, especially in corn and soybean meal and cottonseed meal and canola meal. A big chunk of the phosphorus is phytic acid. Well, ruminants have phytase capability. The rumen bacteria have phytase capability. They can break down that phytate. However, there is data that shows endogenous phytase activity, that is the inherent phytase activity in the rumen, is affected by diet. Several studies in uh, sheep and in beef cattle and in dairy cattle showing that with heat-treated grains, for instance, uh, with cows with a high rate of passage, with diets that are high in organic phosphorus, not all of the phytate is digested in the rumen. This data is a measure of phytase activity in organic phosphorus release uh, micrograms per mill of rumen fluid. So this is higher numbers are greater phytase capa uh, capability. This is a diet with 10% uh, uh, with, that was 100% hay, entirely forage. This is a diet at the other extreme with 90% barley. What we're seeing is that phytase activity was affected by diet. That is not, we, we cannot assume that the ruminant's ability to digest organic phosphorus is fully uh, staffed at all times. The diet affects it. Digging into availability and bioavailability of organic phosphorus is complicated. I show this schematic model simply to represent that. And the good-looking guy on the left is Dr. Mark Hannigan, one of my good colleagues here at Virginia Tech. And he is a, a very useful partner in terms of both uh, animal work but also mechanistic modeling. And together we're working on projects basically working to quantify different fractions of phosphorus in the diet so as to predict their ultimate availability or digestibility. You'll recognize this is the approach we use with carbohydrates, right? We analyze for NDF and ADF and starch and different fractions in the diet, measure the bioavailability of each fraction so as to predict the overall availability of phosphorus, in this case, in the diet. There are analytical challenges. Uh, phosphorus digestion is complicated. This work uh, needs to be done. There are really three reasons we need to go back and look at the question of organic phosphorus availability. And I'll tell you. The first is that uh, we, our diets now contain quite a lot more organic phosphorus than they did 20 or 30 years ago when most of the phosphorus availability work was done. The second is that, frankly, we're learning that the analytical methods for analyzing phytate in manure, in feces, and you have to be able to do that in order to predict the digestibility of phosphorus. Analytical methods previously really were inadequate. Uh, methods you can use to analyze phyt phytic acid in feed don't work for feces. And it's only now that we're realizing that. So some of the older literature that says phytate, phytic acid digestion is complete may be due in part to inadequate analytical methods that just didn't detect the phytic acid in the feces. Third reason that we've got to revisit this availability of phosphorus is modern dairy cows have very high rate of dry matter intake. And you all know that with increasing dry matter intake comes increasing rate of passage. The more organic phosphorus you have in the diet, the faster it's passing, the higher the intake, the faster it's passing through, perhaps the greater likelihood that organic phosphorus is not fully available. So this research has, has there's renewed interest in this research in the last few years. And this is my old major professor, Dr. Mike Allen from Michigan State. And he, when I used to whine about analytical methods or whine about my doing graduate work, he told me if it was easy, everyone would do it. So this is complicated. Um, uh, there is a lot of requests from the field for in improved methods of estimating bioavailability. It's not easy. And that research needs to be done and, has just, and really is, is, there's renewed interest in that now. 
I'll wrap up there as far as the, the science of phosphorus availability, phosphorus requirements. To segue into uh, Jimmy Hufford's presentation, and we'll introduce Jimmy in just a minute. He's a dairy producer from south of here. I want to give you just a brief idea of the CAFO regulations, the environmental regulations that our Virginia dairy farmers are facing, very similar to what most of your clients are. Um, in Virginia, of course, CAFOs, Concentrated Animal Feeding Operations, must obtain a permit. In Virginia, it's called the Virginia Pollution Abatement Permit. The important issues, the important things I think that are specific to each state is, what's a CAFO? In Virginia, it's more than 300 animal units. That is, more than 200 left, or mature dairy cows. The second important question is, are those permits, are your nutrient management plans based on nitrogen or phosphorus? In Virginia, phosphorus-based planning has been the law since 2007. That doesn't mean that every field can only receive manure phosphorus to meet crop needs, but where soil test phosphorus is high, and manure application is limited. So as Jimmy, and, and I'll, I'll stop here, let Kathy introduce our dairy producer, Jimmy Hufford, and let him talk about applications of this on his farm. OK, thank you very much, Catherine. I just want to remind everybody, too, the chat box over on the left-hand side, if you have questions, um, go ahead and type those in, and we'll uh, take those questions um, at the end here. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our second speaker, uh, uh, Mr. Jimmy Hufford of Crockett, Virginia. Jimmy and his brother John operate Hufford Dairy Farm. This dairy herd is a third generation farm and is comprised of registered jerseys with a number of bulls that have gone into um, AI organizations. In January of 2010, Jimmy and his brother John took on a new venture and began processing and bottling their milk in partnership with another local dairy farm. The business name is Duchess Dairy Products. With that, I'll turn the program over to Jimmy, who's going to talk about how environmental regulations have impacted his farm and what management changes have been made. Thank you, J Jimmy. Go ahead. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, I hope I can add something to Catherine's talk. She's an authority on phosphorus, but uh, yeah, my brother and I manage the dairy, and I kind of manage the cows. And, my brother is a crop and lagoon specialist, so yeah, our size dairy uh, must get a permit, CAFO permit, and he's the one that uh, we sample the lagoon in the spring and the fall, and we do know the phosphorus levels in that in that waste product. Uh, I balance the rations for the cows. I have a I've been doing a number of herds for many years, and and we have watched our phosphorus levels in our ration, which is, as Catherine noted, is directly related to what's in the manure. Um, I guess since we're talking about phosphorus, uh, we our fields we we are limited as to how much manure we can apply to a certain ground, whether it's a corn ground or otherwise. Uh, but back early when I started balancing the rations and keeping track of the nutrients, you know, the phosphorus levels recommended by the experts was 0.45 to 0.5 percent in the ration and that's what we did and we of course never had a, a problem with any phosphorus deficiencies or breeding or whatever the case might be. And, uh, but as we became required under the CAFO and the permitting process to lower the phosphorus, uh, we started lowering it in the diet. And then when Catherine came along and took all of the rations from our dairy for 10 or 15 years and the lagoon samples, she says we need to get the phosphorus even lower. So we eliminated a lot of those byproduct feeds that noted earlier and tried to get the phosphorus on down and we got it down below 0.4 percent. I'm showing that figure now, Jimmy, with the spring and fall manure tests and some of the changes over time, if you want to talk through that figure specifically. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, you can see there exactly what I was referring to. Uh, 
early on you're looking at the dietary phosphorus level and where it also showed up in the in the manure. And as we lowered it in the diet, it lowered in the lagoon and we were able to lower it on a, you know effectively. The spring, which is the blue line, is when the cows were kind of confined in the winter and they're, they had no pasture available to them. So their phosphorus levels in the manure was much lower than the fall manure, which cows had access to pasture, which means they were getting additional you know, phosphorus from the pastures. Uh, the little spike at the end is where we are currently, which is we're feeding more and more byproduct feeds. And with that, our phosphorus levels have increased. So, you know, Catherine referred to this program. Well, she had me started early, so I was so low that I had no way to go but up, so she never gave me any money. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, with prices where they are right now, uh, feeding uh, distillers or gluten or whatever increases the dietary phosphorus in our ration. And we're trying to minimize it. We add no other sources other than what's from the feed. We don't know inorganic sources, but it still is increasing slightly. I guess maybe Catherine would like me to mention uh, some of the problems that we had that may or may not be attributed to phosphorus. But in the uh, old days, my grandfather and some of those folks would would tell you that every winter the heifers would eat the bark off of all the trees everywhere, wherever the heifers were in pastures. And they said it was a, a phosphorus deficiency. And when I started doing the nutrition work here and all of our heifers get a balanced grain, it may be four pounds a day, but it's properly balanced for the minerals and they've never eaten bark off of a tree since. So after our, our phosphorus levels in the milk cow ration dropped below 0.4% and sometimes was as low as 0.35%, uh, after about three years of that, we noticed that the cows were eating all of the dried manure on the walls in the barn in the winter. And they, I mean, they licked every wall perfectly clean and uh, we were starting to have cystic ovaries, which is something we'd never had before. And so I called Catherine one day and discussed this with her, and I said, these cows are exhibiting the signs that in the old days we would say was a phosphorus deficiency. And so there was nothing for me to do but uh, at that time, but add just a little bit back. I did that, and that eliminated the problem. And now with us feeding more byproduct feeds and feeds that are higher in phosphorus, like for instance this winter, we're not having any problems. So somewhere, it's, we, we may have the level of her needs correct, but the availability in these feedstuffs, I think, is something that we need to work on and it's going to be a challenge to determine what that is if we want to fine tune and pinpoint the amount of phosphorus that the cow actually receives from, from all the forages and feedstuffs that that she's consuming. Uh, you know, there's some other work out there that is showing now that some of the work with the calcium and, and what it does to phosphorus and availability of phosphorus. And my brother stays on top of the crops and so forth. And, you know, he sees uh, work that shows that if you add a little bit of phosphorus to a soil, say, that's already high and it is meeting the needs of, of corn needs, that corn will do just fine. But if you add additional phosphorus to that corn, every time you add phosphorus, you see a big boost in the production of the corn. So there again, you know, which one is right or which one's wrong? Is, is it not available or is it, or do we have our our requirements a little bit off. I, I really don't feel that's the case, but when we add more phosphorus that should not need to add, the, the plant responds. So 
I think, Catherine, you know, we discussed this, and there's still some work to be done to fine-tune what what we need to have in a diet or what's available and what we need to get to the cow and how do we make it available to the cow. Uh, I don't know any more to add on the phosphorus, uh, but that's the results and the uh, experiences that we've had. Of course, it's still a challenge to keep the phosphorus levels low in the manure so that we can apply and utilize all of the manure that we have available. So we've had to incorporate some of our neighbors' uh, land in, into our nutrient management plan. But our soils are, some are medium and some are high, but we don't have any soils very high. We're, we're fairly low compared to a lot of the counties in the state. But, you know, they only let you apply so much. Uh, so, Catherine, is there any more I need to add? I, I guess I'm about no, exhausted yeah. my phosphorus knowledge. <laughs> well, we know that's not exactly true. Just briefly, um, your outlook, uh, you've still got another probably 20 years of profitable daring to look forward to, and, and then your, your son is a good student here at Tech, so I know he's going to come home and, and do even better. As you look ahead, what are some of the things that uh, you're concerned about, and, and I guess especially focus on environmental issues or environmental regulations? Uh, well, I think from a nutrition end, which, you know, I do nutrition work for other herds on the East Coast, and. Uh, whether it's phosphorus or other minerals, we hopefully will be able to pinpoint the availability in these feedstuffs, especially as we in the livestock industry need to use byproducts at a greater rate and maybe learn how to use these feeds even more effectively uh, because it's hard to compete feeding cows with feedstuffs that humans can consume. So. That, that's one challenge. Of course, the manure environmentally is going to be is a whole other ball game. Uh, you know, the nitrogen in the uh, manure, the nitrogen in the other in the soil that where you apply nitrogen, all of that is a an environmental concern, and maybe where some of the states will be going in the near future. So I, I think all of that we can do from a with minerals and or the proteins or the nitrogen uh, is important in the environmental area. Uh, you know, my son planned on coming back to the farm and, you know, we need to be able to not only know what these issues are but how to address them and uh, hopefully some research here in the near future on the availability and how do we manage these nutrients and can more effectively use them in the livestock industry and increase our efficiency is going to be paramount. I want to touch on the reproduction thing because, uh, again, um, that's something I know that has always concerned you and, and just for everyone, there are a couple of slides I probably ought to have put in here and didn't and that's uh, Dr. Satter out at, at Wisconsin and Dr. Wu is now at, in Pennsylvania. Um, summarized data looking at high producing lactating cows with and without mineral phosphorus in the diet and saw absolutely no impact on reproduction, reproductive performance. And, and that's what the literature will tell you, even with high producing cows, no impact on services per conception or cystic ovaries or days open or any measure of reproductive uh, performance. To find evidence in the literature of any relationship between the diet and reproductive performance uh, attributed to phosphorus, you've got to go back to the 1920s or 30s. There's one study with range-fed cattle in which a group of cows were brought in and confined and fed grain, and, and another group was out on the range and grazing. And, and guess what? The cows that were out grazing, not being supplemented in any way, uh, did not breed back as quickly as the cows who'd been brought in and supplemented. And over time, that one study is what has evolved into kind of a uh, that's the only research study that one can point to. And of course, those cows out on the range were deficient in absolutely everything but the, the kitchen sink, right? They were short on energy and protein and calcium, and, 
and yet it, it somehow is attributed to phosphorus. But Jimmy, I think what you're saying and, and what we are hearing from other nutritionists in the field, um, the vast majority of them say, hey, I'm, I'm feeding 25,000 cows at NRC and seeing no problem at all. But what you're saying, Jimmy, is when you're dropping down lower than that, especially when it's coming a lot from byproducts, I don't, as a researcher, I don't see the evidence for concern in the literature, but I also know that I can't ignore that concern in the field that, again, just like with the feed companies, we don't need to be doing anything uh, that's going to be hurting the profitability of farmers. And, and that's why I, I, I do think there is remains a bit of work to be done with these byproduct feeds, especially high in organic phosphorus. Um, I'll still hang my hat on the literature says absolutely no relationship between dietary phosphorus and reproductive performance, but I can't ignore the concern. This is a different beast, these diets with high passage rates and high organic phosphorus. I, um, I think it's, it's worth doing some research there. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. And, you know, there may be some interactions and some other other problems that were involved that we can't define. And so just to broadly say, hey, it's because of the phosphorus, you know, that's, that's a little, I know that's not where we need to be, but without any other knowledge, that's kind of what we were doing, and that was the one thing we were restricting. But, yeah, we'd like to uh, say that it was something else, and we could fix it easy, too. But we were able to do that, so I don't know. Just give you, you researchers more to do. There you go. Kathy, maybe we'll stop there and, and see if there are any questions. OK. Well, thanks very much, Jimmy. We appreciate your discussion on some of the management changes on your farm and what you've encountered. We have a couple questions here um, from the uh, audience here. Um, first question. What percentage of the cows or farms are covered by the CAFO phosphorus standards in Virginia? Probably that's a question Catherine could address. In Virginia, and I don't want to get the numbers wrong, but about one-third of our dairy farms are on the, are 200 cows and up. Uh, maybe 40% of our dairy farms are 200 cows and up. And so in Virginia, are, uh, do have a VPA permit, which includes the phosphorus-based nutrient management plan. But many, many more of our dairies, in fact, the vast majority of them actually do have nutrient management plans implemented on their farm with a phosphorus standard because, A, it's a good management practice simply to have a nutrient management plan on, implemented on the farm. Uh, and our farmers have found it generally to be cost effective in, in many cases. But also, a nutrient management plan is, is one of the requirements um, for farms that pursue cost share. And our farms in Virginia uh, are obviously very proactive in implementing other best management practices on their farm. Uh, and the nutrient management plan goes right along with that. So probably 35 40% have CAFO permits. But gosh, I'd say I'd venture 80 85% have nutrient management plans. OK. Um, I have another question, kind of two parts. I'll ask the first part, uh, and, and both of you may have some comments. Uh, what are your thoughts on the phosphorus index in, in Virginia? That's, a, that's a, a point of hot, hot uh, contention right now, and I don't want to go too far in it because um, I, don't, I haven't read uh, enough recently about some of the changing recommendations. And, and there are some people on the call that may be able to address this uh, as well or better than I. The phosphorus index is a site-specific tool. And I, th there's, and I don't think anyone argues with the concept. And the concept is that we need to evaluate both source factors, that is, how much phosphorus is in a particular field, but also risk factors, Farm, uh, fields that are close to streams, fields that have a great deal of slope, fields that have no cover crop. Those are fields that are more at risk for phosphorus losses. The concept of the phosphorus index is, let's focus on those fields that are high in phosphorus and high risk for runoff. That that is where we really need to focus our best management practices to be sure that we limit manure application, uh, that we uh, install uh, buffer strips, cover crops, and so on. The, and, and so the, nobody argues with the concept. I know that. Um, some of the environmental organizations and, and certainly the EPA is concerned that with the phosphorus index, uh, 
they're not seeing soil test phosphorus drop as rap rapidly as they'd like to see. And so there is contention that these, this phosphorus index is allowing manure application, continues to allow manure application on some very high phosphorus soils. There's, that's, an, that's, that's, about all, that's about all I can say about that. I, 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 the concept is very strong, may evolve in its implementation. The other part of that question, and maybe that maybe it relates to the phosphorus index, it has to do with regarding the uh, proposed NRCS 590 standards, and I myself am not quite sure about those. So said that they're out for comment this month. Yes, they're out for comment this month. Um, I haven't prepared my comments yet. I'm I'm sorry, Kathy. I don't want to go very far with that. That's fine. Yep. Okay. I would. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you, a, the, a, I guess, maybe just a couple of perspectives. A, a general conclusion of that revision um, is we really need to uh, have a, a concerted training effort on how to use phosphorus indexes for nutrient management. And that there's, no, there's not scientific evidence to, su to support the use of soil test phosphorus alone or a phosphorus saturation index alone in determining manure application rates. There is risk of using those two, th one of those two alone in that, uh, in terms of the maintenance of a, of a strong agriculture industry in certain areas. I, I don't think we're going to get, a, I don't think we should get away entirely from, it, from the, the issue of risk, that some fields are at greater risk than others and that those fields are where we ought to focus. I think the question is simply, are there points at which and at what point uh, should we just simply not allow them application. Uh, and that's, it's, it's, a, it's a point of hot debate right now. I, I think we've got to be careful to let the science guide us, and soil test phosphorus alone is not sufficient. Meaning that soil test phosphorus alone will lead us uh, to ban manure applications in fields that perhaps are not especially high risk for phosphorus losses. Yeah, that's, that's probably as far as I want to go. Okay. I don't have any other questions that have been uh, submitted. I uh, guess maybe we'll give people just one more chance here. I, Catherine, maybe you could comment on maybe some of the research that you're currently working on related to this topic. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, and, and again, I'll, I'll give myself about a two-minute limit because otherwise, Kathy, I could go on for. for okay. <laughs> we're we're hot on this question of of. Uh, determining the phosphorus fractions in the feed that might help us to predict the availability of the phosphorus. And again, the concept is very much like we use to predict the uh, degradability of protein or the digestibility of fiber. Let's identify those different fractions in the feed, whether it's phytic acid, organic phosphorus, uh, inorganic phosphorus. Learn, learn what relationships What's the relationship between those fractions and the ultimate digestibility or availability of the phosphorus in the feedstuff? Um, and so we're actively developing those analytical methods, and I've got a couple of great grad students working on uh, those, those, those questions. And the challenge really is to be able to analyze in, with similar assays in both the feed and the feces. And we've made some really great progress just in the last six months um, in analyzing feces samples, especially for Phytic acid, some of its degradation products, um, and this sounds obvious. It's pretty esoteric and, and, and pretty narrow, like all research is, I suppose. But the application of this is going to be exciting. We've done a bunch of, of uh, research studies just in this last six months or a year, in which we fed cows the diets differing in uh, organic phosphorus source, in which we fed cows uh, with and without uh, phytases, and we are going to be able to apply just in this next six months or so these analytical methods and really get at this question of, A, what's the bioavailability of those feeds? Is it changed when you add phytase? Is it changed with different feed stuff? But more important, let's develop some prediction equations based on the, fraction, the feed fractionation um, that, you know, you don't want to have to feed every feed combination to cows and do a total collection study. You want to be able to develop these methods that you can apply to feeds and accurately predict their bioavailability. Um, right, I think my two minutes is up, but we're pretty excited about the progress that we're making. That's great. I, it sounds like a lot of good uh, good studies, and I know everybody will be looking forward to 
finding out what your results are. So the last, I have another question here for Jimmy. And the question is, at what level are byproduct feeds being used in your herd's uh, diets? Uh, right now, hmm, I would say probably a third of the dry matter intake. Uh, wow. like four, let's see, four. Yeah, it's getting from a fourth to a third right now, at least. What byproducts are you using mostly, Jimmy? I'm sorry? Which ones are you using? Well, we're using dried gluten right now because it's kind of a local product. And we're also using some cotton seed. I know there's distillers in my other, other feed. Uh, there's a... I don't know if you'd call citrus pulp one, but we would refer to it as that. It's it's in our diet. Uh, some soy hulls, not much, but there's a significant amount of distillers in another feed that we're using that comes from a mill. And so when you add all those up, some of them that you don't have bulk here, I think it becomes a significant amount. I need to come get some more manure samples then. You got a lot of organic phosphorus in there. Yeah, you don't need to come get any right now. <laughs> well, send it to me. I'm sorry. Just send it to me. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Here's another question: um, Is there any research in the effect of near infrared scanners for precision feeding in the excretion of nitrogen and phosphorus? I'll stay with phosphorus. Uh, for my as my area of expertise, um, and tell you that wet chemistry analysis is is far better because we're talking about mineral elements, and most of these infrared um, assays are are measuring car the bonds between carbon and something else. That's that's the chemistry that they're actually reflecting the light off of, and, and I'm simplifying horribly. Uh, uh, Joe Harrison's probably cringing as he hears me uh, butcher that. But it, for inorganic elements, NIR is not appropriate because these inorganic elements don't have those carbon bonds. So certainly just for inorganic phosphorus or even total phosphorus, NIR is not relevant. Uh, uh, it's got to be wet chemistry. Now, could we take, you know, I'm, I'm, fa I'm fascinated by this question of organic phosphorus availability, right? And so therefore, what's the, the residual organic phosphorus in the feces? And is there an application there? I don't know. I hadn't thought about that. Maybe that's a whole new research idea. But in general, NIR, when we're looking at mineral elements, whether it's calcium or, or phosphorus or magnesium, they are inorganic. There's no carbon bond there, and that's what NIR requires. OK. Well, thank you. It looks like we've um, taken care of the questions that have been submitted. And I would just, again, like to thank uh, Catherine and Jimmy for taking time sharing your, your knowledge and expertise with us today. And thank you very much.